So I'm going to give you a talk on uh, concepts and promises, but uh, I have also um, the purpose in this talk to improve your life immediately um, by giving you um, a little glance on how this precision medicine and the developments in precision medicine can impact on your life straight away. Um, and uh, this is going to be part of this, this talk. Now, the very first person who started uh, to talk about precision medicine was Paul Ehrlich. Uh, Paul Ehrlich worked here in uh, Berlin uh, until he contracted tuberculosis and um, uh, was awarded with a Nobel Prize in 1908. And uh, I'm proud to say, and it's also humbling to say, that my desk actually looks as his, as his, uh, as you can see here, and uh, he's uh, uh, he's been an incredibly um, uh, forward-thinking worker, and uh, has introduced into medicine the, the 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 notion of magic bullets, and these magic bullets in German Zauberkugeln, uh, the magic bullets, uh, he said, would be aimed at harmful cells only. This was uh, the great new concept and achievement that he was thinking of. And uh, by doing this, he introduced a lot of notions, uh, like the antibody. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for the side chain theory, macromolecules uh, from bacteria to which antibodies would be uh, uh, targeted uh, at and then uh, could eradicate the disease. He introduces the concept of receptors and complement into biology and the notion of chemotherapy. He was the first to uh, actually introduce this notion into medicine. He developed together with a, uh, um, a Japanese co-worker, he developed uh, the first synthetic drug uh, that was used in uh, infectious diseases. Uh, Salvarsan, uh, which, uh, which was uh, an arsenic uh, compound uh, for the treatment of Treponema pallidum. Now, in 2015, things have changed. Uh, President Obama gave a, uh, a lecture on precision medicine, uh, State of the Union address, and, and, and emphasized that nowadays uh, what we are looking at is a molecular level of uh, medicine and uh, the concepts. Uh, should evolve into more uh, precise and sophisticated subtypes of uh, diseases. So what concepts can we derive from that? We actually can derive the concept of targeting isolated genetic abnormalities. So you have diseases that are monogenetic. Uh, and you could develop a gene inhibitor or you could uh, develop a viral vector which would then be introduced into the cell. And then uh, instead of having the defunct gene, you would have a new gene which has been brought in by the viral vector and then improve uh, the uh, genetics of this cell. You could also inhibit pathways. So you have um, a pathway which is disturbed and then you would inhibit this pathway which um, uh, leads to uh, atypical proliferation of cells. And this inhibition would then reduce the load of tumor cells and uh, maybe also eradicate the disease. Finally, the cells develop according to certain uh, processes and checkpoints, and you could inhibit checkpoints or guide the immune attack uh, specifically and use the immune system of your body to eradicate disease. I'm going to touch upon most of those concepts and give you some insight into what happens. So let's start with monogenetic diseases. Monogenetic diseases like chronic myeloid leukemia. Chronic myeloid leukemia is a disease where you increase your white cell count enormously. So the normal white cell count, as you know, is five to 10,000 per microliters. And these people have 200, 250, 300, or 400,000 white blood cells per microliters. And this is due to a translocation between chromosome nine 
and chromosome 22, you see that the Abelson gene is translocated to the so-called breaking cluster region. And this gives you a fusion protein, which is called BCR able. And this BCR able fusion gene, gene leads to incessant proliferation of the cell and it multiplies. This is actually not so much of a problem. If you have 200,000 of white blood cells, that should still be okay. But the problem is that this unhampered proliferation will lead to transformation into acute leukemia. And this acute leukemia usually is absolutely deadly in CML. So if you look at the survival of CML in the past, uh, where we used chemotherapy, essentially chemotherapy, uh, to uh, maintain a white blood cell count of five to 10,000, you see that median overall survival was about three to four years. And you see now that the inhibition of one single gene has uh, become true with the drug imatinib uh, developed by Novartis. Um, overall survival after five years uh, approaches 90%. So monogenetic pathways can be inhibited and, as you can see, not only lead to complete hematological remission, which means that you have a normalization of the white blood cell count, but also to complete cytogenetic remission. You cannot find the 922 translocation, the so-called Philadelphia chromosome anymore. Moreover, if you look deeper into the genome, even the molecular abnormality, the bcr able fusion protein cannot be found anymore, which leads you to major molecular or complete molecular remission. And it has been shown that if you keep patients for two to three years in major molecular remission, you can probably eradicate the disease and 50% of those patients can actually stop taking the drug and will be cured. Could you have made money with this? Yes, you could have made money, a lot of money with that, because Novartis in 1999 developed this drug and people actually got some kind of information about that and bought quite a lot. You see the volume here, red and green, the volume of shares that have been traded at that time. And you see that Novartis actually did nicely since. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of more examples. And if you want to take notes, <laughs> it's going to improve your financial, uh, <laughs> your financial possibilities in the, in the future. Novartis is still a good bet, uh, uh, I suppose, because they are now entering a phase where they have um, uh, got the first approval for a chimeric antigen receptor therapy. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So examples of monogenetic diseases are uh, a lot. There are a lot of examples. You have the FLIP3 uh, inhibitors. You have the IDH2 inhibitors. You have so-called BRAF inhibitors in, 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 in several diseases, not only in hematology, in hairy cell leukemia, but also in melanoma, working very, very nicely. Um, and then you have uh, inhibitors to other genes or their products, KIT, ALK, ROS in uh, solid tumors, and this obviously has changed uh, the fate of those patients dramatically. But you can also inhibit structures on the cell surface. Uh, the first of those was an antibody directed against B cells of lymphoma cells, rituximab. Uh, MAB means monoclonal antibody, and uh, then you have a prefix over here which tells you whether this has been developed in a, uh, a mouse or in a rat or in a, uh, in a monkey, etc., etc. And then it also tells you whether it's a chimeric antibody, etc., etc. And then you have the first couple of letters which are just the idea of the developer, uh, developing uh, um, uh, uh, company. So you have rituximab in B-cell lymphomas, ofatumumab, obinutuzumab in, uh, in B-cell lymphomas, alamtuzumab in T-cell lymphomas, and now very new daratumumab in multiple myeloma. Uh, incredibly effective uh, um, treatment, but you also have in solid tumors a number of very important uh, antibodies that have been uh, directed against cell surface uh, uh, proteins 
including one which is bevacizumab, which is used in various cancer cell types and has been developed by Roche. And um, this is very interesting because it is used in many different diseases, not only in colon cancer, but also in, in breast cancer, in lung cancer, etc., which uh, increases the likelihood of uh, some patients to get the disease. Even in gynecological tumors, we use bevacizumab, and um, it actually binds to certain proteins which increase angiogenesis which increase the likelihood of the tumor to get oxygen and other nutrition uh, from, from the body. And by targeting the uh, vascular endothelial growth factors, by targeting those, the tumor is unable to actually increase angiogenesis and therefore shrinks and becomes less aggressive. Next point would be pathway inhibition. So you have this uh, structure on the cell surface and then this structure on the cell surface will lead to some kind of uh, pathway activation and this pathway being activated will then lead to proliferation of the cell. So if you can interfere with the pathway you will stop the cell from uh, proliferating and one pathway is the uh, endothelial growth factor receptor which can be inhibited in non-small cell lung cancer. You have B-cell receptor inhibition in B-cell lymphoma and RAS inhibition in colon cancer, many, 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 many others. These are just examples. Uh, one very new concept is the neurotrophic tyrosine receptor kinases which are rearranged and detected in many cancers. And the important point about that is that this neurotrophic tyrosine receptor kinase can be activated in those many cancers. It's always the same pathway which is actually activated. And if you interfere with that pathway, these tumors shrink regardless of their nature. So a salivary gland tumor will shrink as well as the thyroid cancer or breast cancer. And there's a drug called entrectinib which is a potent inhibitor of NTRK and is also CNS active. And a parent compound has just one um, um, fast track approval in the United States by the FDA, but it's not actually CNS active. And can you make money with that? Probably. You see Loxo Oncology has just brought uh, this molecule to a, a fast track um, approval in the United States, but Ignita, sorry, but Ignita, who is developing the CNS active uh, uh, drug, is actually not yet on the market. And you see that uh, since the uh, development of Loxo has uh, materialized, uh, Ignita also has, has gone up quite substantially and um, is actually an interesting bet on the future. So the next thing I want to talk about is breast cancer. As you know, when um, cells uh, uh, proliferate, uh, uh, the hibernating phase of a cell is the G0 uh, G phase, and then it goes into G1, and at a certain um, point, it switches from G1 into synthetic phase, from synthetic phase into G2, and it go then goes into mitosis. And those points, uh, those uh, transition points are very tightly regulated by so-called um, cyclin-dependent kinases. And one of those, or two of those kinases, which interact uh, uh, and therefore lead to transition of the G1 to the S phase are the cyclin-dependent kinases 4 and 6. And two drugs have been developed uh, in uh, breast cancer, CDK4-6 kinase inhibitors, palbociclib and ribociclib. Ribociclib comes from Novartis, palbociclib comes from uh, Pfizer, and they are doubling the event-free survival, this is disease-free survival, the time until you have to switch from uh, treatment, from this treatment to another treatment to chemotherapy. So as a matter of fact, what happens is that these patients are Ta taking, they, they, they take an anti-hormonal treatment and another tablet, uh, which is palbociclib or 
another three tablets, which is ribociclib. And uh, the time until they have to switch to chemotherapy is going to be doubled from about 12 to 24 months. They do have side effects, obviously, hematological and hepatic, but it's very impressive to see patients with breast cancer improve their lives. And could you have made money with that? Yes, you could have with Pfizer doing very well since they started actually developing, developing this drug. It's, the story is probably not over. Gene therapy revolution, this is not really um, aimed at cancer at this moment. It's rather for genetic diseases which are inherited and you can actually with a vector change the genetic um, uh, material within a cell and, and, then, and then improve, improve uh, the, uh, the, the genetic uh, the chromosomes of the patients there, and I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but what I'm going to talk is about uh, checkpoint inhibition. And uh, this is Checkpoint Charlie, uh, as actually I have known it. Um, uh, in Germany, all uh, school children had to go to Berlin at least once in their school time and had to see different points. And one point we all went to is Checkpoint Charlie. And you see that at that point, um, the German, the uh, German was not v uh, valued very much. You see here, it says you are leaving the American sector. Then you have the Russian. We we are here is Amerikanskova sektora. Then you have the French. Vous sortez du secteur américain, and then you see the German. <laughs> see what does it say? Sie Sie verlassen den Amerikanischen. <laughs> So these are the checkpoints and checkpoints also exist in the cell recognition. So a T cell which uh, has very uh, heavy strong uh, cytotoxic effects actually needs to be regulated and they are being regulated by two points, the T cell receptor recognizing a structure on the target cell and then by inhibitors of um, activity which are the programmed death ligands or the programmed death receptors. If the T cell receptor gets to a uh, structure and the programmed death receptors are not inhibited, the cytotoxic T cell will kill the cell. I'm telling my patients that these these cells, kind of a normal cell, kind of wears an ID card and says, listen, I am part of your body. And then the T cell recognizes that and says, okay, you can pass. And the next cell comes, you can pass, you can pass, you can pass. And if this cell does not exhibit these programmed death ligands, then the T cell will say, okay, you can't pass. And uh, there is lysis of the cell. Now, if you if you inhibit those by uh, uh, developing anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1 antibodies, then obviously you can let the uh, uh, T cell target tumors. And this has just materialized in non-small -cell, non cell lung cancer, but also in other cancers like melanoma and uh, is a very important addition to our armamentarium. As you know, uh, in malignant melanoma, for instance, there are patients who now have five-year overall survival instead of months uh, earlier. So very important addition by uh, inhibiting T-cell tolerance. Now, the problem for you as a radiologist is that the disease now behaves a little bit differently. So you may have conventional uh, response to the tumor, uh, shrinkage of the tumor, but you may also have slow tumor progression and then shrinkage uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the future. Or you may see some kind of unconventional response. Start of therapy, you have an increase, and then you have uh, additional um, uh, abnormalities uh, that appear on uh, radiological exams and then the tumor actually shrinks. So very difficult to understand and uh, it really needs a multidisciplinary uh, disciplinary, uh, approach to, to actually um, 
uh, get a notion of the of the clear response to the uh, checkpoint inhibition. And yes, you could have made money with that by investing in Merck or other uh, um, companies that develop that. But the latest development are chimeric antigen receptor uh, uh, treatments. And the CAR T cells, the CAR T cells are very elegant because what you do is actually you take a tumor cell out of the body of this patient. And then what you do is you isolate a structure on that cell and you say, I want to direct the T cell response to that single structure. And then you take this antibody and you implant it into a T cell. So you give the T cell the ability to recognize a cell which it would not have had before. And then this cytotoxic T cell is going to be reinfused in the body of a patient and then kills the cells. And uh, Carl June did this uh, with um, hematolo in hematological malignancies in acute lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, 11 of 12 children who uh, had acute lymphocytic leukemia were actually brought into remission with this. And uh, there are further developments, as you can see, many, many targets exist uh, uh, where you can apply this concept. One target is uh, in prostate cancer. One target is in multiple myeloma, the BCMA molecule on the uh, surface of the uh, myeloma cell. Why is that important? Because BCMA is specific to those ones, as is PSMA to prostate cancer. So you actually can identify a target to which you direct the T cell. And there are many uh, CAR T cell studies around the globe, as you can see. But you are limited. You're limited to one single target. Um, you can uh, have uh, suppression of T cells. For instance, if you use uh, corticosteroids or so, you would have a negative environmental effect. You have sometimes limited access to the tumor microenvironment, so these could be limitations to the strategy. But the strategy is very uh, important. Here I'm, I'm showing the negative microenvironmental uh, micro uh, possibilities. The, the, the CAR T cells can be inhibited by T regulatory cells, etc., etc., etc. But the, it's, a, it's a very important uh, development, and one company that is developing this is Bluebird Bio. Uh, and Bluebird Bio is actually developing this one, the BCMA antibody. And in multiple myeloma, 11 patients uh, uh, have been um, treated with the anti-BCMA CAR T cell, and there was a 100% response rate in those patients who actually got uh, who got uh, the, the amount of drug that was pre-specified in the study. So very impressive uh, results for patients who, had, who have had several uh, uh, previous treatments and have had uh, uh, no response to the latest treatments. So to uh, sum up, I would say that the treatment in hematology and oncology will change fundamentally, has changed fundamentally, but will change fundamentally in the, in the future. Novel treatment strategy, uh, strategies will certainly necessitate to amend, to amend response criteria. Imaging techniques will have to adapt uh, to that, and uh, the specialization in oncology and probably in radiological diagnostics will also uh, become ever more sophisticated and uh, more and novel interdisciplinary activities will emerge. With that, I would like to close. Thanks very much. <laughs>